Welcome to Fantasy Cartography, the show where we see what maps can teach us about fantasy and what fantasy can teach us about maps. Today, I'm going to explain how your primary school maths class secretly taught you about one of the biggest problems in cartography. So way back in primary school geometry, you probably learned about nets. For those of you who don't remember, the net of a three-dimensional object is an arrangement of two-dimensional shapes that can be folded to become the faces of that object. For example, this is the net of an octahedron. Cut this shape out, fold it along the edges, and you'll have your very own papercraft D8. But one net that you wouldn't have learned about in primary school is the net of a sphere. And that's because a sphere doesn't actually have one. You can make a cylinder or a cone out of paper, but there's no easy way to make a sphere. And that is the heart of the projection problem, the biggest problem in cartography. In spite of what B.O.B. may have told you, the Earth is, in fact, round. It's round! <laughs> Not quite a perfect sphere, the spin of the planet makes it slightly wider around the equator than around the poles, but close enough to a sphere for today's purposes. Because spheres don't have a net, there isn't an easy way to fold the Earth down onto a piece of paper. In fact, it's mathematically impossible, although please don't ask me to explain the actual maths. The most accurate way to map the Earth is onto a globe. The Earth is round. It's round, it's round, it's round. And a globe is round. round. So you get to bypass that problem. But a paper map is way more convenient than a globe. So cartographers have to come up with a trick to take the Earth which is round, it's round! <laughs> and pretend that it's flat. The way they do that is to imagine that the Earth is a shape which can be flattened, like a cylinder or a cone, and then draw the map based on how the lines of latitude and longitude look on the imaginary shape. This is the art and science of cartographic projection. And, like most things in cartography, it runs into both scientific and cultural criticism. The map projection which is most familiar in the world today is the Mercator projection. This was invented by Gerardus Mercator in 1569, who wanted to make a map that would be useful to sailors. And he did a pretty good job. The Mercator projection accurately represents compass bearings and the shapes of coastlines. If you zoom all the way out on Google Maps, you'll notice that their projection is pretty similar to the Mercator, because Google wants the Maps program to maintain a consistent shape as you zoom in. The problem with the Mercator is that we in the West started using it for everything. You see, while the Mercator keeps the shapes of coastlines very accurate, it's wildly inaccurate when it comes to the area of countries. More specifically, the further something is from the equator, the bigger the Mercator projection makes it look. That means that the Mercator has been criticised for Western cultural imperialism, because it makes the powers of Europe and America look much bigger than countries that are closer to the equator. That's where the German historian and filmmaker Arno Peters comes in. Peters devised his own map projection in the 1970s, and he spent the rest of his life marketing the heck out of it. The Peters projection accurately represents the physical area of every country. In that respect, it's commendable, but it certainly isn't perfect. The Mercator represents shape accurately, but badly distorts area. The Peters represents area accurately, but badly distorts shape you would not want to use a Peters map to navigate the coast of Greenland. The real problem is that Arno Peters wasn't afraid to misrepresent cartographic history in the process of selling his map. He pushed the cultural imperialism angle really heavily and claimed that his map was a wholly original idea. But not only was the Peters projection not the world's first equal area projection, the oldest one I could find is the Stabius Werner, invented in about 1500, it wasn't even a wholly original piece. An almost identical map had been developed in 1855 by Reverend James Gall Jr., a clergyman and astronomer. The difference was that Gall treated the projection as a curious side note to his astronomical work, whereas Peters was a lot louder. Peters was right to say that it's important to read maps critically, and to say that we shouldn't use the Mercator for everything, but he wasn't right about much else. It isn't a straight trade between area and shape either. The other property that you might want to preserve is scale a map which accurately represents the distance between any two points. Unfortunately, that's almost impossible to do unless you actually use a globe. 
When you look at a professionally made world map, instead of having a simple scale bar like you'd find on a smaller map, instead they'll have a monstrous beast like this because the scale of the map will change with latitude. A few projections hit sort of close to a consistent scale. An equirectangular projection maps latitude and longitude to horizontal and vertical position, which makes it really good for computer data sets. An azimuthal projection, like the United Nations logo or Leonard Gelk's Toronto-centred map, can show you exactly how far any point on the Earth is from the centre of the map. Mora's two-point equidistant projection can do the same thing with two locus points, and Chamberlain's trimetric projection can almost do the same thing with three but neither of those projections can be used to map the entire Earth. Of course, a lot of maps are designed as compromise projections. Instead of aiming for perfect representation of any one factor, you make something which minimises distortion and still looks good. The Robinson and the Winkle triple are the best examples. These often use a curved shape around the edges. Another interesting way to make a compromise projection is to turn the Earth into a shape which does have a net and then flatten that. These maps are sometimes called orange peel maps, because it's sort of like what would happen if you peeled an orange and then flattened the peel with a rolling pin. This is where we get things like the Good Homola sign, Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion map, and the Waterman butterfly projection. Orange peel maps get over a lot of the distortion problems and hit a good balance between shape and area, but you really don't want to use them to travel across the ocean. In the end, a lot of people's preferences around map projection seem to be based on marketing. Arno Peters may not have been a wholly original thinker, but he was a really good marketer, which is why the Peters map is still controversial while the almost identical goal map was a historical footnote. The Robinson exploded in popularity in 1988 when the National Geographic Society adopted it for general use, and then, ten years later, the NGS switched to the Winkle Triple, and that exploded in popularity as well. Look deep enough on the internet and you'll find devoted fans and dedicated haters of pretty much any map projection you can name. But mathematically speaking, there is no perfect projection. Every projection has trade-offs, so it's much more sensible to figure out why a map is and isn't useful rather than deciding which one is best. So what does all this have to do with fantasy? Well, not a lot really. Sorry, this is one of those things which is much more important to real cartography than it is to fantasy. You see, while projection is extremely important when you're trying to make a world map, it doesn't matter quite so much on a smaller scale. As a rough estimate, it only comes into play when you're attempting to map an area greater than about one-eighth of a planet's surface. Only the longest and most epic fantasy stories get larger than that. Even Lord of the Rings never quite went that far. Most fantasy maps seem to be built on the assumption of accurate shape. They're using something like the Mercator rather than something like the Peters, although there's no way to tell that unless the cartographer explicitly writes it down. A lot of fantasy world maps use a straight scale bar instead of a latitude adjusted scale, which doesn't help. So about the best I can offer on this front is a bit of curious speculation. Look at the map for A Song of Ice and Fire, for example. In this world, a lot of the more technologically advanced cities are fairly close to the equator, while the northern stretches of Westeros are seen as cruel and barbaric even when they aren't full of ice zombies. It's possible that the cartographers of southern Westeros and western Essos would prefer something like the Peters projection, specifically because it makes the northern latitudes look smaller. In other words, instead of using Peters to stop Eurocentric racism, they'd use it to promote Andal-centric racism. On the flip side, we can look at the pre-reboot map for Warhammer Fantasy, which is also one of the most lazy and bad fantasy maps ever, but that's not important right now. One of the few vaguely original features here is that Greenland has been replaced by the circular island of Ulthuan, the home of the High Elves. Since the circular shape of Ulthuan is very important to elven culture, it seems fairly likely that the High Elves really wouldn't like any map which distorts that shape, so they'd pressure the other civilizations towards something more like Mercator. Lastly, I'd like to jump across to the sci-fi end and talk about possible projections for non-spherical worlds. You can make a perfectly accurate map of a flat planet simply by copying the shape of the planet from above. Pictures of the disk world show the planet is slightly curved, so it's possible there'd be a small amount of distortion in the process of putting it on paper, but nothing as extreme as mapping the real Earth. You might be able to make an accurate projection of a ring-shaped planet depending on what parts you want to map. If the developed parts of the world are largely flat, as depicted in Halo, you just have to pick a point to split the ring and then roll it flat. 
but a more curved ring shape like a lot of space stations doesn't map nearly so well. Similarly, donut shapes also can't be projected onto a flat surface without distortion, for the same mathematical reasons as spheres. And if you can even vaguely visualise how to project a donut planet onto flat paper with any semblance of accuracy, you're better at this than me. That's it for this episode of Fantasy Cartography. You can stay until after the credits for the unrelated interesting fact of the day. Please subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon, and give this video a thumbs up if you learned anything. The full script is available on fantasycartography.tumblr.com. You can ask me questions with the Tumblr Ask box, or by using Facebook, Twitter, or a trained Waterman butterfly. Questions and corrections can be emailed to fantasycartography at iinet.net.au. Until next time, may your fantasy be cartographic, and your cartography be fantastic. <laughs>